Well, welcome and thank you so much for being a part of this worship service. Before we get into God's word for today, let's unite our hearts together in prayer and go before him with hearts of joy. Father God, we thank you so much for being our God. Lord, we thank you so much for being such an awesome God. Lord, we thank you for creating us in order to worship you and to praise you and to give you the love that you alone deserve. Lord, we thank you for the lives that you have given to us and pray that you would help us, that you would empower us to live our lives for you and that we would live our lives as living sacrifices to you as well and that we would give our lives, Lord, even for the church that you love so much. We praise you and thank you, Father, and we ask your Holy Spirit that he would use the truths of this message and of this word, Lord, to really grow us in our faithfulness to you. We thank you and praise you in Christ, and we pray. Amen. Well, to begin this message, I just want to ask you a very simple question, just to reflect on in your own life and see if it's true. That simple question is, has anyone ever given you any busy work, like meaningless work? They just didn't have anything for you to do, but they wanted to occupy your time, and so they just gave you a little bit of busy work. Maybe it was a teacher many years ago who didn't want you just sitting there doing nothing, and so she just gave you a little coloring book assignment, or maybe gave you uh, an easy math assignment just to occupy your time. Or maybe it was a boss who didn't just want you sitting in your cubicle doing nothing, fiddling your thumbs, and so they just gave you meaningless work that didn't have an effect on anything, but was just meaningless just to occupy your time. Uh, many years ago, I led a team down to Ecuador, and we were down there in order to help the poor people down there and some of the orphans, and also to build a house for one of the poor families and the church. And so the very first day that we got there, we were ready to work, and the foreman was there. He met us, but there was no materials. We noticed that there wasn't really anything uh, to build a house. And so he looked around and he told us, why don't you guys go ahead and dig a big hole, as big of a hole as you possibly can, and just put all the dirt next to the hole. And so all of us got to work and we were working so hard. We we're eager to be down there and working. We dug this big hole and it worked so hard that in fact, a couple of guys got sick and they weren't able to work the, the rest of the week. And then the foreman came back and he was eating like a sandwich and he was looking around and then he noticed that there's no materials. And so he said, okay, now move that pile of dirt that you guys just made from here to over there. And so we were eager to work. And so we started getting the shovels and wheelbarrows and we moved that pile of dirt from here to over there. And then he came back and he was always eating. This time eating like a burrito or something like that. And he looked at the pile of dirt and he said, okay, now you guys move that pile of dirt from over there to way over there. And by now we just figured it out. And so once he left, I told the team, hey, why don't you go around in the neighborhood and introduce yourself. We're going to be here for a couple of weeks. And so just spend some time building relationships. And I saw that there was a tractor a couple of houses down and I was going to go talk to the owner and just say, hey, we need to move this pile of dirt. Can we just give you some money to move the pile? I mean, we're Americans. We don't really work, like working that hard, especially if it's meaningless. We kind of figured out the whole system. And then the foreman came back and he noticed that that pile of dirt was still in that same spot. And so he was really angry. He was upset with us. Like, why didn't you move that pile of dirt from over there to over there? Because I was going to have you move it from to the other side. And we just said, hey, if you want us to move that pile of dirt again, we're going to ask our neighbor right here if we can borrow his tractor. You probably will. We'll just move it wherever you want to. We figured it out. But what that did actually was that it actually encouraged us to lose trust and a little bit of confidence in this foreman because we realized that he was more than ready to give us meaningless work. And it really kind of upset us. And so for the rest of the trip, we weren't sure when he told us to do something, if it was busy work, if it was just something that he wanted to occupy our time with. Now, unfortunately, so many Christians think that prayer is God's busy work for us. And whether you realize it or not, you might have this attitude like, I'm not sure if this prayer thing really works. I remember a time in my life when I prayed for something and God didn't answer my prayer. And so, you know, I don't think it has an effect on anything. God's really going to do what he's going to do anyways. And he set the plans for this entire universe and all of history before the creation of the universe. I know that. And so how can my little prayers have any effect on anything? And so for so many Christians, uh, the Barna Institute has said they pray less than 
a minute every day, less than 60 seconds a day. And for many Christians, less than a minute for the entire week. And that's, a, that's really a, a sad thing, and it's unfortunate. And so for today, for today's message, our hope and our prayer is that this message will come as a great encouragement to you to build you up into the prayer warrior that God wants you to be, and that we wouldn't see prayer as just God's busy work for us. And so the first thing that we're going to see is the number one reason for why Christians really don't want to pray. The main reason to not pray. And what we're going to be doing is actually going to be debunking that reason, that lie of Satan to not pray. And we're going to be looking at the flip side, which is actually our first reason and a great reason to pray and to be doing it often. And then after that, we'll be taking a look at some passages that really give us three more really good reasons to pray. And again, our hope and our prayer is that this message will be so encouraging to you, inspiring to you, and that you will be on your way to being a great prayer warrior if you're not already. And so let's dive into God's Word and look at the very first reason to pray. And actually, right before that, we'll see this number one reason to not pray. It's Satan's lie, one of his most effective lies that affects our hearts and our relationship with God. And this is the lie. The lie is simply this, that there is no need to pray because God's plan is already set because God is already going to do what he's going to do. He's going to do what he's planned since the beginning of the creation of the world, the creation of the universe. And so we can't change God's mind. We can't change God's plan. And so really there's no point in praying, right? And we have, even have this attitude and this saying, and maybe we don't say it out loud, but we kind of have it in the back of our minds. And it's que sera, sera. It's Latin for whatever will be, will be. And that's a kind of the saying of somebody who's really laid back, not a prayer warrior. And, you know, don't worry about things because, you know, whatever is going to happen is going to happen anyways. You can't fight against it. You can't do anything about it. And so you just have to accept it, good or bad. You have to accept it. Que sera, sera. And it's a really common saying, but it's not a Christian saying. It shouldn't be a part of our Christianity at all, just to say whatever is going to happen is going to happen. And you can't change the, the mind of God. You can't change the plans. And here's the truth, actually. And I know this is going to be a little bit controversial. But the truth is that prayer has the power to move God. Now, we can't change God. He's immutable. That means he's unchangeable in terms of his character. But we can move him. The prayers of a righteous person, the prayers of any saint, any Christian, are powerful and effective. We can actually move God. And you might be a little bit skeptical right now, and that's okay. And so we'll take a look, but look at a couple of examples, a couple of stories in the Bible that teach that we can actually move God from one attitude to another and actually change his mind. And you might be skeptical, but here's story number one. Example number one from Exodus 17 verses 10 to 13. Now, in this example, Moses is actually going to affect things by his prayers. And the whole point of the story that God is giving to us is that we can actually affect the course of history and events by our prayers and really move God. And this is what it says. It says, Joshua did as Moses told him. Now, now Joshua is Moses' command, Israel's commander, his, their general. And so he fought with Amalek. Now, just not just one man, but he actually fought against the entire arm, thousands of men, tens of thousands of Amalekites. While Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill in order to take a nap, right? Now, actually, it says this, verse 11. Whenever Moses held up his hand, okay, so he's, he's praying, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, it says then the Melekites, Amalek, prevailed. And so he's holding up his hand. And notice that he's not holding up his hand for just five minutes or so. This battle is taking hours and, and hours. And so his, his hand, and notice it doesn't say both of his hands right here, but his, he's holding up his hand. He's praying for the Israelites, the, for Joshua and the soldiers. But your hand's going to get tired. Your arm's going to get tired. And so whenever his arm got tired and put it down, then they would start to lose, he noticed. And everybody noticed. And so he put his hand up again. 
and they'd begin to win again. God would give them the advantage and they would start to win in this battle. And then it goes on and says this, but Moses' arms grew weary. They grew tired. And so what do they do? Well, his good buddies did this. So they took a stone, that's Aaron and Hur. They took a stone, a large stone, and they put it under him. And so he could sit down. And so he sat on it. And while Aaron and Hur held up his hands uh, on his side, one on each side, uh, and the other, one on the other, so his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And so it's always important to have people that can help you to pray. Sometimes we grow a little bit weary in praying. But they held up his hands, alternating, so that he could always have his hands up. So they could always be praying for the Israelite soldiers and warriors. And behold, what happened at the end? How did it end? And so verse 13 says, And Joshua overwhelmed the Amalekites and his people with the sword. They won. God gave them the, this victory. God empowered them to win this battle, this huge battle. But how did they do it? Well, it was by prayer. That's the whole point of this whole story, is that we can affect the course of events and actually change history. And our prayers are powerful and effective, that we can actually move God. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, that's probably just a coincidence, that whenever Moses held up his hand, that they started to win. And whenever he got tired and put out his hand, that they started to, probably just some kind of weird coincidence. And the Bible is probably not teaching that prayer actually is effective. And so let me give you another example. And this one actually is even more powerful, I think, and even more compelling in teaching us that our prayers can actually change the mind of God and the course of history. And so this is example number two from Numbers 14. And God is about to destroy the Israelites because they're so disobedient and they're grumbling so much. And this is what it says in verse 11. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, How long, how long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me? In spite of all the signs that I have done among them, I took them through the Red Sea. I've done all these great things for them, saved them from Pharaoh and from Egypt and have done miracle and miracle after miracle for them. And then it goes on and says this, I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them. And I'll make of you, talking to Moses, I'll make of you a, a nation greater and mightier than, than they, mightier than Israel even. And so God is so frustrated, he's so upset, it's a righteous anger because the people are disobedient and they lack faith and they're grumbling. They want to go back to Egypt and they're not satisfied with God and what he has given to them. And so God says, I'm going to smite them. I'm going to end them. I'm going to give them a vi pestilence, this virus or bacteria, and just let them wither there in the desert. He has this righteous anger toward them. And he's exhibiting, showing, manifesting his justice against them. But then... Moses prays and he intercedes for the Israelites, our spiritual ancestors, and we can be just like them, can't we? But then it goes on and says this. Moses says, now if you kill this people, the Israelites, as one man, then the nations who have heard your, of your fame will say, it's because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land that he swore to give to them, that he has killed them in the wilderness. Please. Lord, pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Continue to forgive the people of Israel, is what Moses is saying. And so he's interceding for our spiritual ancestors, and he's a foreshadowing of what Jesus Christ would do in the even greater way. Moses foreshadows what Jesus Christ would do in being our representative and interceding for us through this prayer. And so what does God do? Well, he's immutable, right? He can't change his mind. But actually, listen to this. Verse 20 says, Then the Lord said, Then God said, I have pardoned according to your word. According to your word. According to your prayer, just as you have asked me humbly coming to me, I have done what you asked me to do. 
And it actually appears that God has completely changed his mind. He hasn't completely changed his mind, but he has changed his mind because he said he was going to destroy the Israelites right then and there with pestilence, with, violence, with um, a virus or bacteria, but he decided not to. He instead, if you want to read on, he lets that generation stay in the desert. He doesn't allow them to go into the promised land, and he lets Joshua and the next generation go into the promised land. But he did change his mind as, as far as he didn't kill them right then and there. They didn't get what they deserved by ju God's justice right then and right there. And so it actually shows that God listens to our prayers. Our prayers are powerful and effective. And so here's reason to pray, number one. That debunks the, the lie that our prayers don't matter. But reason to pray, number one, simply is this, that prayers from God's children, prayers from the smallest to the greatest of God's children, all those who are covered by the righteousness of Christ, for every single person who knows the gospel, believes the gospel, and has placed their faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, and has come to repentance, to live for his glory and his glory alone. For each and every person, your, your prayers are so powerful. Prayers from God's children, all of them, have the power to draw out God's mercy, to move God from being a just God, ready to pick up his sword in justice, to move him toward a God who is ready and willing to forgive and ascend his Holy Spirit and an olive branch. We can do that by our, our prayers. That's the Bible teaches. And God listens to us. He listens to us attentively. And we have the power to draw out his mercy and also to alter the course of the earth. Even though God's plans have been established since the beginning of the universe, since his creation, we can actually, in a very strange way, alter the course of the earth and God's plans manifested by our prayers. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it just takes a moment just to think about that, just how amazing that is and how powerful the prayers of God the righteous of the saints of God's children really are not because of our strength not because of anything within us but because God loves his children it's because of God's power it's because of his love as well and so I want to write some of these up here as a summary the very first reason we get to summarize to pray is prayers have the power to move God prayers have the power to actually move God and hopefully you can reflect on it and meditate and the more you realize that it really wants to forces us to really pray more and more because we realize that our our prayers from you know just humble people lowly people actually are powerful enough to move God now I want to talk before I move on about the prayer warriors paradox and I think that this is really interesting there may be some who are actually thinking about this right now but it's really interesting that we can actually affect the course of the earth. We can actually affect the events of history by our, by our prayers. And that's what those two examples were saying. I mean, things could be going completely sideways. And things, if you noticed, in our country and in our world, they're kind of going pretty sideways right now. But when we pray, when a prayer warrior prays to the Lord and intercedes for our nation and asks for a great revival and a great awakening, then God can hear our prayers. He does. He hears our prayers. Our prayers are powerful and effective, and he can change the course of our world. And he'll listen to us, and so we can intercede, and we want to intercede for our world and for our nation and for the church as well, for unbelievers. Now, looking back, if we were to look back, we would actually see that we didn't alter things in God's plan, but it was actually a straight line. Why? Because God actually ordained for us to pray for things and he planned to change things anyways and so when we look back in his story in history then we see that it's really a straight line it seems like things were going sideways and then God all of a sudden intervened but he planned for his people his children to pray and to intervene and so it's actually God's part of God's plan that his people would pray and pray often and so we've debunked the number one reason to not pray, or one of the reasons, one of the main reasons to not pray, and we've given a strong reason to pray and pray often. 
And here are three more reasons to pray. The very first one, and actually prayer reason number two, is simply this. Then when God is about to do something good, and when he's about to do something great, and everything that God actually does is good and is great, but he moves people to pray. And so if God wants to move a massive mountain, then he'll actually have a couple of people or maybe a million people pray that he would move that mountain. And then when he does, everybody knows that it was God and they see how good and great he is. Now that's just a theoretical example, but people always think that God just creates things and does things ex nihilo, just willy-nilly. Like if God wants a, a little baby goat, a little kid to come into existence, then he'll just poof cause it to come into existence. But our God not only ordains the ends, which in this case is this little kid coming to, in existence, but he actually also ordains the means. And so he'll have two goats, a male and a female goat, come together uh, to get married, and they'll have eventually a little kid. He ordains not just the ends, but he ordains the means, every single thing in between to make that come about. Now, here's another example. Imagine uh, one of your friends or one of your family members, one of the members of our church, somebody that you really love and care about. Imagine that they are sick. Imagine that they have COVID or some kind of heart disease or they're in the hospital for some reason. And God is about to heal this person. He's about to extend his hand in order to heal this person and to show his kindness and his goodness and his greatness. Well, before he does that great thing, that, that good thing, before he does that, he'll actually move people and have them, empower them to pray for that person's healing. So after those people are on their knees and asking the Lord for healing for that person, once he does that, those people who prayed, were there, they're going to be the people who are most inspired and encouraged to give all the glory to God. They were right there. They saw God's hand moving and working. Their hearts were in it, and God just showed them more than anyone else his goodness and his kindness. And so whenever God is about to do anything good and anything great, before he does that, he has his people, some of his people, pray that that good and great thing would come about so that he would be glorified in the hearts and minds of everyone who prayed, way more so than those who didn't pray. And so this is what it says in 1 Samuel verse um, 16 of chapter 12 it says stand stand still and see this great thing that the lord will do before your eyes stand still and watch and see and pray that god is going to do this great thing because after he does it those who prayed on their knees and wholeheartedly with full hearts they're going to be the ones who give god the most glory they saw the before and after picture you know, I have this one friend who used to live on the streets and he was addicted to alcohol and he was addicted to drugs and he was a junkie and he was pretty much just a zombie. And sadly, we see so many thousands of people, millions of people around the world who are addicted to drugs and it's just really disheartening. I mean, we see these videos of them on the internet and by the droves in the inner cities. They're just they're just standing there like zombies and some, sometimes in weird positions and they're just yelling at cars and they've lost their minds. And for so many people, including Christians, we've pretty much lost faith that anything good could come with this person, that even God could heal them or that he will heal them. And so nothing's done. Prayers are not lifted up for these people. But this good friend of mine had a couple of people in his life that really prayed on, on their knees every single day, wholeheartedly for this individual, for this good friend, eventually would become a good friend of mine. And miraculously, amazingly, uh, God sent some people into his life to show the gospel with him. He gave his life to Christ, but not only that, but he was eventually healed of his addictions. He became clean and healthy, and eventually he just joined the church as a believer, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ and serving also wholeheartedly. He was like a completely or he was a completely different person, unrecognizable, just sitting there with his glasses, studying God's word, no longer homeless, but helping other people turn around, use his spiritual gifts to help other people. It was just amazing transformation. Now, if you just met this individual after he was healed and after he was redeemed, 
then you wouldn't really think that anything great happened, any miracle took place. You wouldn't really believe it. But if you saw him before as a, a junkie and you saw him after as a redeemed person, then you would probably give some glory to God. But those couple of people who are praying on their knees every single day and just crying out to the Lord for his salvation and crying out to the Lord for his healing, you better believe that those two people, they gave more glory to God and praised God and just loved him for his goodness and for his kindness and stood in awe of him for his greatness more than anybody else. And so prayer is a tremendous gift that God gives to us so that we can see his hand of goodness and kindness and we can see him clearly for all of his mercy and his grace and his goodness and his greatness. You know, people always ask the question, hey, what's the purpose of life? What's the meaning of life anyways? And I think that for so many of us, without even thinking about it, we naturally think that the purpose of life is for us to achieve things. We want to achieve things through our career or through school. We even want to have a good family because that's an achievement. And we want to be able to, at the end of our life, look back and see that we've achieved all of these things. And we can even say we've achieved these things for God and for His glory. But that's actually way off. The purpose of life, you can look at it as, as being this, is to see and to know God's greatness and goodness. The purpose of life is not about us. It's not about us doing great things at all. The purpose of life has everything to do with knowing God and seeing constantly who He is and seeing His kindness and His goodness, His grace, His mercy, and His holiness, and to see His righteousness and to see Him for who He is. And that's what we're going to be doing, actually, not just in this life, but for the rest of eternity. It's about seeing God and His glory and seeing it clear and clear. That's the purpose of life, really. And so prayer is a gift. And we can even say that the purpose of life is to pray, to have this intimate relationship with God and to be praying so that we can see His glory and see just how beautiful and awesome He is. And so that's reason to pray number two. Number one is it's the power to move God. Number two is it's our life's purpose. Our life's purpose is to pray so that we can know and see God for who He is, the beautiful and awesome God that He truly is. Reason to pray number three is changing gears a little bit. And I know that this is going to take a little bit of work for some of you. It might not have any kind of meaning for you at all. And so it's going to require a little bit of work on my part to really make sure that it's meaningful here. And I'm really praying and asking the Holy Spirit, especially, that He would work in your heart now to make this next reason one that is inspiring and encouraging to you. And that will actually help you to pray in a positive way. But here it is. Reason to pray number three is that the Lord commands us to pray. And He commands us to pray often. And so it says that all throughout Scripture, all throughout the Bible. But here's one place that it says that really clearly. It's from 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 to 18. It simply says this. God says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Pray constantly. Pray all the time. Pray all throughout the day. Pray even as you're working, as you're driving. Have that intimate relationship with God and be in prayer all the time, unceasingly. And then it goes on and says, Give thanks in all circumstances, not just in the good, but also in bad circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This is God's will. People always ask, what's God's will for me? Well, God's will for you, and we might not expect it, is to pray. God's will for us is to be praying constantly. And I know that for many people who are listening to this, they're thinking, I know God wants us to pray. And I think that one of the scariest verses, if you want to put it that way, or I think one of the most haunting verses in all the Bible, there's two of them, I think. And the first one goes like this. It's from Luke 6, 46. And that's where the Lord Jesus Christ, our King, our Commander, says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not do what I tell you to do? Why are you going to call me Lord, King, Commander, if you're not going to do what I say? And there's so many times in my life, and maybe this resonates for you too, where we know what God wants us to do. In this case, to pray constantly. 
But we kind of say in our hearts, yeah, I know that's what you want me to do, Lord, but there's so many more fun things to do. And I'm really too busy with work or school or my family. I'm really too busy to just carve out some time to pause from my life and to give you the attention and to pray, God, you understand. But the Lord responds and says, no, I don't understand. Why do you call me Lord if you're not going to do what I say? And that goes hand in hand with the other most haunting verse, I think, in my opinion, uh, in all of Scripture. And that's where God tells this story. This is where the Lord Jesus Christ says this. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name? And do many mighty works in your name. Like, how are you not going to let us into heaven? We did all these things for you, Jesus. We served you. We served you in the church. We served you faithfully. I did all these good things. I took care of the poor. Prophesied even. Doing all these good things. And this, how does God respond? How does the Lord Jesus Christ respond? And it says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You workers of lawlessness. And I think this is very haunting and really scary because it says it doesn't matter if you do a lot of good things. It doesn't matter if you do a lot of good things for Jesus. If you don't have that personal relationship with him, and if you're not living with him truly as your Lord, where you're willing to give up the things that you want to do in order to obey Christ and be obedient to him and to glorify him, it doesn't matter how many things you do in Jesus' name and serve within the church and, and give. It doesn't matter. You have to live with him as your Lord on a daily basis. And in this case, be obedient to him and his command to us to pray. To pray constantly, unceasingly. It doesn't matter if our days are busy. We can still pray to him while at work. While we're doing our work in our minds and within our hearts, we can still be praying to him. But it's one of the most haunting things. There's so many times, like I said, in my life where I feel like doing what I want to do and I don't feel like praying, maybe. And, you know, as we begin to become prayer warriors, we're given lists of all these people to pray for. Not just people that we know, but the people that they know, people we've never even met before. And a prayer warrior just spends a time uh, putting aside everything else that we feel like doing, all the fun things or even our responsibilities. And remember, this is the prior, priority of our life. And, and just spend a good amount of time going through all the names and, and praying for it. And sometimes we don't feel like doing that. And so we remember the Lord's words. Why do you call me Lord if you're not going to do what I say? If you're not going to do what I command you to do, to pray unceasingly and to keep prayer as the priority of your life? You know, there's a really good book that I recommend to everyone. It's called Desiring God. It's written by this awesome pastor, um, Pastor John Piper. And if you haven't read this book, make sure you read it. It's a paradigm shift. It's a life-changing book. And it's all about the purpose of life being to enjoy God, to know Him and to see His kindness and goodness and, and really to enjoy Him, to delight in Him, to desire Him. That's why the title is called Desiring God. But within this book, there's this major concept and theme that we are to become Christian hedonists. And a Christian hedonist is somebody who really enjoys serving and really enjoys worship. He doesn't do it just out of a sense of duty, but sees life as enjoying Christ and enjoying God. It's really a, a tremendous paradigm shift and so helpful for so many people. But I think that a lot of Christians have really misunderstood the... Uh, message of this really good book. There's so many Christians who, after reading this book, have said, you know what, I'm not going to serve anymore in the way that I've been serving because I'm not really enjoying it. And, you know, I know that I'm supposed to pray. I know that I'm supposed to pray through these lists of people who need healing and need salvation, but I don't really feel like doing it and so I'm not going to do it. I don't really enjoy it. I've read the book, Desiring God, and I want to be a hedonist, a Christian hedonist. And so they've not only become Christian hedonists, they have actually become just hedonists. A hedonist is somebody who uh, just does whatever makes them feel good and whatever makes them feel happy. If it makes you happy, it makes you, if it makes you feel good, then do it. And it's good and it's right. But if it doesn't make you happy, 
then don't do it. And so they've quit serving in certain contexts because of their feelings and it doesn't make them feel good. And they've quit doing many things like worshiping the Lord and just doesn't float their boat anymore. They've really misunderstood this because the Lord says, even if you don't feel good, if it doesn't make you happy, there are so many things that I ask you to do that I'm commanding you, you to do. And whether you feel like doing it or not, whether it makes you feel good, it doesn't matter. Take up your cross. That might not feel good. Be willing to give up your life. That may not make you happy to give up your life in that moment. And sitting through a list of hundreds of people, there's so many more things that someone who's just starting off as a prayer warrior would rather do. Binge watching Netflix, watching TV, watching good sports games. There's so many other things. But we remember the Lord's words, our commander and our king. Why do you call me Lord? Why do you call me commander? Why do you call me king? If you're not going to do what I command you to do. And that is to be obedient and to pray constantly. And that's the purpose of, of life. And so we have to make sure that we understand what a Christian hedonist really is. There's so many things in life that aren't immediately joyful or enjoyable. And yet the Lord commands us to do it. And so we enjoy just being obedient to him. But one question to ask and one question the Holy Spirit is asking you is, are you praying without ceasing? Are you praying constantly? Are you being obedient to Jesus' command and having that as a priority of our lives? And I think we just have to go before, before the Lord so many times and just say, Lord, I confess I'm not praying constantly. I'm not praying as you want me to do. And so thank you so much for your forgiveness. Dust, thank you so much for your grace. And empower me out of thankfulness and out of gratitude to be a prayer warrior who prays even when I don't feel like it. But that's reason to pray number three is it's our priority. Jesus is our Lord, he's our king, he's our commander, and so it's our priority whether we feel like it or, or not. Now, reason to pray number four is this. God loves it when you pray. Remember that, that God is smiling and he loves it when you pray. And it's not like he's up there and he's lonely and he's bored and that he's not uh, self-sufficient in and of itself and he's not content without, without you, but he... He loves you as his child. If you are a child of God, if you've given your life to Christ, he loves you. And the same thing for every father. We love it when our children talk with us. Now, John MacArthur actually says it even stronger. It's a little bit different. But he says this. He says that God yearns to hear our prayers. Pastor John MacArthur has made a great point that God is, he yearns. As our father, as our parent, he yearns to hear you speaking with him, and even if it's to ask for something, he still yearns to hear your voice. It, it really pleases God. And so here's a couple of verses that teach this. 1 Peter 3.12 says this, For the eyes of the Lord, the eyes of God, are on the righteous, on his children, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. God's ears are attentive. He's listening. He's watching you. Not to judge you, but because he loves you, he looks at you in an adoring way. And his ears, when you pray, they're so attentive. It's not like he can't listen to billions of people around the world constantly praying at the same time. He can't listen to all of them. He gets distracted. He can't multitask. He can be attentive to each and every one of us. That's the first verse. The second one is from the book of Revelation. Revelation 8.4, and it says this. It says, the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Our prayers are compared with incense and, and not the stinky kind of incense. You know, sometimes when you go into like a Asian, certain Asian restaurants and there's a big gold Buddha in the front and a little bowl of incense, uh, it kind of stinks a little bit like that Rastafarian one. It's, some people it smells a little bit good and other people kind of makes us cough. It's not like that. This kind of incense is really sweet smelling. It's like, it's more like perfume, like a really good perfume. And it really immediately has an effect on us. It just causes us to wake up and to, to be happy, really. Perfume has an effect. And that's what God is comparing our prayers to. It just brings this huge smile to his face whenever he hears us pray. You know, the number one complaint from every single per, uh, parent that I talk to 
is not that their kids are playing too many video games or they're not getting the straight A's that they want them to. The number one complaint is not that their kid isn't as good at sports that they would like for their kids to be. I mean, maybe it's a little bit of, there's a little bit of disappointment there, but that's not the number one complaint. The number one complaint from every single parent who has teenage kids or older is that their kid doesn't speak with them anymore, doesn't talk to them anymore. They just start grunting. They're not sure exactly when that started. And I have a son who is a teenager. He's 12 teen and it's already started already. But all the talking that they used to do when they were young, they used to come home when they were four or five years old. And when we first saw them, they just couldn't stop talking. Like, Daddy, guess what I did today? I wrote my name on my paper. I mean, it's very mundane stuff, but we love to hear their voice and love to hear that because we love them. We wanted to hear them and we wanted to communicate with them. But they say some silly things and we love to hear like, Daddy, I wrote my name on a paper and it was backwards and my teacher, she uh, corrected me. And then we uh, played some sports that day and we did all these fun things, Daddy. And it was amazing. And we were just laughing, I mean, it just causes us to laugh. a huge smile on our face, just laugh to hear that. And they're not sure if we're laughing at them or with them, it doesn't matter, they're gonna keep on talking. But eventually when they become teenagers, the number one complaint is my teenage son or daughter, as soon as they come home, I'll ask them a question like, how was your day? And just, uh. And then they'll go up to their rooms and just look at their phones, close the door, shut the door, go on their phones, go on their computer, some kind of device. And I'll call up to them like, hey, how's it going? You do you want to come down here and talk? Do you want to come down and eat dinner? And, just, ah. and that's the number one complaint is that their child that they love so much doesn't want to talk to them anymore. And that's kind of how God feels as well when we don't speak with him. He loves us. He loves us to death. He loves us as much as he loves his own son. And yet we're not talking with him. And so he yearns to hear our prayers. Now at the same time, as I look at our older son and other parents share this as well when they're with grandma those same teenagers who just grunt all of a sudden become super articulate and can't stop talking now why is that it's because grandma and sometimes grandpa's too but especially grandma she just has this overwhelming all-out acceptance unconditional love and even if they're saying the craziest things and talking about the the nuttiest things in the world talking about Minecraft or some girl that they met. Grandma's always, she's always been all ears. It's not her job to discipline the children. And so she doesn't tell them when they're talking about something that's a little bit inappropriate. And she's just all ears and she's laughing with them and just showing her all out acceptance and unconditional love. But those same teenagers who are just grunting at us, those same teenagers are talking to grandma nonstop, just telling grandma about their new video game that they played or some new kid at school. And grandma's just all ears. And these kids are going on and on, all of a sudden articulate, loquacious, just verbose going on and on. And it's because they know that grandma is all ears and, and really loves to hear their talk. And it's the same way with God. And, and so here's the truth. Here's a very simple, truth. We love to talk to those who love to hear us talk. I mean, think about that racist person down the street, your neighbor who doesn't really like you. I mean, how often do you have a conversation and tell that person how your day is going? You probably don't say a single word to that person. On the other hand, the people in your life that you love talking to and open up to, those are people who no matter what you say, they're not going to judge you. They're not going to be critical of you. And they you can tell they love to hear you talk. And it's the same way with God. The more we realize that he loves to hear us pray, no matter what it is, to, to give our complaints to him or to ask him for things or even to tell him how great and how good he is, the more you realize that God loves to hear your prayers and he yearns to hear your prayers, the more you will find yourself praying and talking with him and talking with him throughout the day. And so... Prayer has the power to move God. It's our purpose in life to pray. It's our priority, and it also pleases God. It pleases God for us to come to Him and just lay it all bare 
knowing that he loves to hear our prayers. Will you pray with me? Father God, we come before you and we thank you so much, Lord, that you are a great God, an awesome God who is infinitely powerful, and we stand in awe of you. But Lord, we thank you also that you are a perfectly merciful and loving God who loves to hear our prayers. Sometimes, Father, we need to think past the lies and the barriers to prayer. Uh, Lord, our hearts sometimes tell us that you don't want to hear our complaints, that you don't want to hear us uh, and our sins. But Lord, we uh, need to be convinced by the power of your Holy Spirit that it's okay to come before you, even with our complaints, to go directly to you. And Lord, that you love it when we pray to you, that you yearn to hear our prayers and that you're so pleased. And so we thank you, Father, and we ask that your Holy Spirit would grow us more and more so as obedient children who love to pray to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.